Good morning, everyone. Um, this is No Compromises, React, Relay, and GraphQL on Drupal 8. Um, I'm Sebastian, also known as Fubi. I'm Campbell, also known as Oh the Huge Manatee. And Mosh Weitzman, going by Mosh Weitzman. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> right, so why no compromises? Um, we three have, and a couple of other people have been working on a very interesting project recently where we were able to reuse um, lots of interesting technologies that we have been introducing slowly into the Drupal community over the past year. Um, and uh, it's no compromises because we have finally made it onto a project where we can use the full stack. We are using GraphQL for the data layer, uh, Relay for communicating with the Drupal backend um, through GraphQL, and we're using React for a fully decoupled front end. Um, so we have a very complete stack of different technologies. Um, this is just an excerpt. I'm going to quickly introduce you to a couple of these logos, so we, you will see them across the presentation later. Um, it might make sense so that you understand what we are talking about. So for authentication, we are using R0. Um, for data fetching and for communicating with the backend, we are using GraphQL, which is the top left logo, and we are using Relay to communicate uh, between GraphQL and React. Um, we are using React for the view layer for rendering our front-end application, and we are using Redux for the local state in our application, and we are using Express.js on a node server to pre-render our HTML through React um, so that you can uh, get a pre-rendered representation of the full page before even having the JavaScript on your client side, and so that Google search engines or other search engines can uh, index the site without having to worry about rendering the JavaScript. Um, for building our JavaScript or the front end in general, we are using Webpack and we are using various plugins in the Webpack build chain, like CSS modules, to um, be able to fully use the component based approach that React is popular for. So we'll begin by talking a little bit about the GraphQL stack that we have in the back end, and for that, Moshe, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm going to start by uh, just demonstrating GraphQL uh, and how it interacts with your Drupal backend. Okay, hopefully that looks all right. Okay, so what did I just do there? Um, where we are right now in the title, in the URL bar, I went to my development site and I went to a URL called GraphQL slash Explorer. All right. Um, this is a page that is uh, brought to you by the GraphQL module for Drupal. And um, what we're seeing at this page is a, a pretty special feature of GraphQL called GraphIQL. This is a in-browser IDE that Facebook made for the GraphQL community. So what you can do at this page is you can browse your whole GraphQL schema. You can write queries. Uh, while you're writing queries, there's real-time autocomplete for the fields that are available, and there's real-time validation for the query that you're authoring. Um, and it's really easy to um, iteratively build a query and run the results and make sure it's coming back just the way you want. Um, so the actual query that you're seeing here uh, starts with the word node. Um, and that's just an unfortunate um, overlap with the Drupal concept of a node. Um, basically, that's the entry point to load a single entity. Okay, So this particular query that I wrote is loading a single entity. And you can see the parameter to the node entry point is ID2. So we're loading the second entity in the system. Um, and then inside these curly braces, 
we're telling GraphQL what fields from that entity we want returned, okay? Um, so this is one of the main benefits of GraphQL is that there's one entry point. Um, in this case, the Drupal module exposes slash GraphQL. Um, and the query author, meaning the client side, is the one who says exactly what the shape of the response is that they want back, all right? Um, the caller is saying, in this case, entity number two, and only the title back. And if you look on the left-hand side, this is the query section of GraphIQL. On the right-hand side is the response, okay? And let's say I want more than just title. I clicked enter there, and then I click control space. Control space um, is the way that you trigger the autocomplete for GraphIQL. So these are all of the fields that are uh, common to all entities. Um, so if I care to also see the type of uh, entity number two, I just auto-complete it to type, I press Control, Enter, and I issued a new GraphQL query, and I'm gonna see the results on the right-hand side. You'll notice that in my JSON response on the right-hand side, there's a type field that just arrived, um, and inside of that, there's the target ID, which is article. Um, the reason why it has that nesting is because article is actually a configuration entity, okay? Going forward, um, there are more fields that I could choose to put in here. I want to put in the UID, right? All entities have a user ID that is the owner of the entity. Um, and furthermore, I can do more um, here around the UID. I can actually say I want the whole entity. So um, what you're seeing here is that you can write GraphQL queries that do more than just return one entity, all right? Here in the response, um, not only are we getting the UID's number, the reference to the author, which is itself an entity, we are getting the full entity. So this is everything that Drupal knows about the user ID, in this case, number one, okay? Uh, the name, the mail, the time zone for user number one, and so forth. So GraphQL can easily follow entity references. Um, and the you know, awesome byproduct of being able to get all of this in one query is that your client-side application is much faster than having to make multiple round-trip HTTP queries. Um, so the core REST API uh, out of the box would require multiple HTTP requests for the, the sort of data that you're seeing in the response here. Um, GraphQL doesn't require multiple and neither does the JSON API. Um, those are kind of the three popular ways to do web services in Drupal 8. Um, and this is a real big benefit for GraphQL. Um, I guess I made a tangential reference to this, the GraphQL schema when I started. Um, the Drupal module um, does something pretty awesome that I want you guys to know about. The Drupal entity API, right, can have any number of entity types um, and fields associated with those entities. So the site that we're working on right now, um, here we are at the article uh, manage fields page. So this is pretty typical, typical for Drupal. We have an article content type. Um, and we have a bunch of fields associated with it. Um, and the fields have their settings and so forth. So the GraphQL module reads all of this entity definition data and builds a GraphQL schema out of it. And you know, so we, we really are taking advantage of all the hard work that is done in Entity API, and below that, the Type Data API, and we're building a proper schema out of it. And once we have a proper schema, um, we just have awesome tools that can be built on top of it, like this graphical browser that has type ahead knowledge of all of the fields that are available to you. So um, I just wanna show you a different kind of query. Um, here, our entry point was node. Another one is called node query. And this one 
uh, node query type article, I think is how this works. Node query is used for getting listings. Okay, so um, the first one was just a single entity load. Um, node query is for getting multiple back. So you can see the response just came in. Um, there's actually two responses here, two titles. It might be more clear what's going on if I actually show their IDs. Um, their NID, node ID. Um, you'll see that uh, it's like article number one and article number two on the site, or two and three. Um, so uh, we have an entry point to request listings as well. So this is analogous to views that we use in um, site building. Um, the GraphQL module uh, builds upon the entity query API in Drupal. Uh, so the module translates these incoming queries uh, from the React front end and runs entity query in the background. All right, so entity query is a great API in Drupal if you haven't used it. Um, it's storage agnostic, so if you decide to store your entities in Mongo or you try decide to do something optimized there, um, all of this is just going to work because of the entity query abstraction. Um, if you decide to change your schema while you're site building, uh, you decide to add a new field. Um, the GraphQL module is smart enough to rebuild its GraphQL schema anytime there's entity definition changes. Okay, we use the cache tags API. It's super simple to do that. Um, other thing I want to say is that uh, we respect the entity access control that the Drupal Entity API provides, both at the listing layer and at the field layer. All right, so I have an access protected field. I want to show you how that works here. Okay, so I've enhanced the query a little bit here. Um, and I used a new syntax that we haven't seen before with uh, triple dots coming in front. Um, we have, um, what we have said here is that um, for the entities that are coming down, um, if they are of type article, uh, we're gonna show the bundle fields. That what's available to me are the bundle fields that are um, attached to articles. In this case, I created a gender field really quickly um, and it's a true-false you know, uh, field, which is pretty weird for gender, but gender's a little weird in general. So um, that seemed like the safest thing to do. Um, and we see for um, these two entities that are getting returned, one has gender true and one has gender false. Okay, so I'm logged into um, GraphQL and issuing queries as UID number one. So I clearly have access to everything I have access to the gender field. Um, if we look over here, this is our structure uh, page, and now the detail on the gender field. You can see that I've used the field permissions module to make this a private field. So only the author and administrators can view the gender field. So how GraphQL handles this I've switched browsers. I'm now over in um, Firefox. And am I issuing a, let's do, let's just copy the query that I ran over here into Firefox. Firefox is logged in as a regular user, not as a privileged user. Okay, so the same two articles came back with three fields, just like I requested them. Uh, the only difference is the value of gender is null now. Okay, so um, this person who issued the query doesn't have access to gender fields, so doesn't get the value for genders. So, you know, the GraphQL module maintainers have been very careful to respect entity access control and field access control. All right. Um, at the same time, we're respectful of the caller. The caller said they wanted gender back, so we're going to give gender back. We're not going to give them JavaScript errors because the shape of their response is unexpected. Uh, so we return the gender field in our response, but we don't give the value, okay? 
Um, all right, so just moving on to the actual benefits. I want to summarize those. How does that look? Not perfect. That's better. Almost better. Um, the benefits of GraphQL. We minimize the number of HTTP requests. Okay, that's the biggest one. Our, our calling applications are faster. Specifically so you don't get stuck at a loading screen like that. <laughs> right. Um, the size of the HTTP response is quite a bit smaller. And it's smaller because you recall that only the fields that were requested are, re are returned in a GraphQL um, response. So if you compare that with the core REST API, your responses are everything. You get all the fields. Um, if you were to not want all the fields, you have to do server-side work to, to make a new REST plugin that only returns some of them, or perhaps do an alter to server-side alter to remove some fields. In either case, you have now created some burden on the back-end team in order to fulfill what the front-end team wants. So um, the number and size of the HTTP uh, responses and requests is different. Um, I talked about the shape of the response being exactly what the client wants. Okay. Um, another huge benefit of the GraphQL web services is that you no longer have versioned APIs. It's common in REST to have uh, an endpoint that is version one and an endpoint that's version two, that sort of thing. Um, you don't need that in GraphQL because really the client is responsible for dictating what they want in the request and the response. Um, and they do that within the parameters of what the server is offering. Uh, which is to say the JSON schema that the server has published. All right. Um, there is a way to deprecate formally your properties in a, in a GraphQL schema. So you let the clients know what's going on. Um, and I talked about this rich schema that's built out of the Drupal, API, the Drupal Entity API. Um, it's kept up to date and auto-generated whenever there's changes. Um, because we have a rich schema in GraphQL, we can build cool features like graphical and, uh, for example, our front end, our React front end, likes to um, validate that the queries are um, valid during build time, during JavaScript build time. They compare against the published um, GraphQL schema and flag any client-side queries that are no longer valid during build time. A little bit about the momentum uh, behind GraphQL. There was a huge announcement recently um, that GitHub is going to provide all of their API over GraphQL. Um, traditionally, that's been a REST API that many of us has, have used. Uh, they decided that that was insufficient for their internal uses, and they thought it was probably insufficient for some of their clients, and so they're also providing all of their great data over GraphQL. Um, the spec finally has reached 1.0. It's something that everyone can rely on and build upon. Um, and uh, you know, since we're at DrupalCon, the Drupal module is in really good shape and has had recent development um, this week. We would love if people joined us at the sprint tomorrow um, and helped uh, push it even further. Some of the new um, advancements in the module are listed there. Okay, we have relay compliance, we have um, an OOP approach to schema generation, and we support config entities in addition to con entities, which is also the REST API doesn't yet do. Okay, so um, you want to switch laptops? Yeah. If can we, we could... switch to number two, please. I mean, theoretically, we'll be looking at the same slide, so I won't know. <laughs> All right, so one important piece of context for this project uh, that we've been working on is this is not about building a single site. Right? Actually, the objective is building a framework where you can have a an almost entirely independent front-end team that is building tens and tens of sites, something around 100, 200 sites. You don't want to have to be changing back-end support for all of them. That makes something like GraphQL really important, uh, where the client gets to dictate the schema. It also means that there's a real problem around authentication, because we don't know what you're going to be building your front-end application in. We want to make sure that whatever authentication system we have supports everything. 
Uh, and what's more, because the client gets to ask for whatever it wants, that we have a great way to send queries, being able to authenticate the user uh, who is going to be receiving the data is important. It's also actually worth mentioning these are not brochureware sites. A lot of the time when we do decoupled demos, you see a relatively uh, simple site. These are front-end sites that have real interaction. Um, the first one we're doing has user forums, for example. Um, we have editors on the back end that want to be able to jump into the front end and see their drafts and see how that layout works. Obviously, we don't want to be, really, we don't want to be showing that to anonymous users. Um, on top of that, this same authentication method has to be able to be supported in Drupal for people to get into the back end uh, and do their content editing there. That's probably the lowest bar. We know how that system works. So no matter what, we need an authentication system that's shared between front and back end, and it has to be available to the front end developers really early in the build. So we abstract authentication out to Auth0, which is a software as a service authentication provider. Uh, Auth0 gives us, well, first of all, it gives us a really easy interface for the client to do their user management tasks and their uh, login attempt audit tasks. That's wonderful that I don't have to worry about that. It also supports a variety of identity providers on the back end, gives it, makes it quite easy to integrate them. So whatever you want from Active Directory to your own custom database structure to who knows what um, in any combination. It also will use social login providers, if you like. So Facebook, Google, Microsoft, again, you name it, and in whatever combination you name it. Uh, that gives us a lot of flexibility for the front-end website to determine what social logins or what methods of login are appropriate for their user base. It does single sign-on as well. It takes care of a lot of these kind of relatively complex problems. And it gives us a lot of flexibility on the implementation side. Uh, actually, Auth0 brags at the top of the documentation, if you can make an HTTP request, you can support Auth0 logins. I apologize for the pun at the bottom of this slide. We're not even using LDAP bind, but I just couldn't resist. <laughs> oh man, how many people know, got the joke with LDAP bind? Hands up. Okay, that makes me feel much better. Whew. So it's important to note and, and bear in mind the distinction between authentication and authorization. We're abstracting authentication out to Auth0, but the entire permissioning structure it remains in Drupal. Once we know who a user is, Drupal handles authorization for their specific field level access. So if you're not familiar with the general Auth problem, you can shorthand this as thinking about Auth0 providing the login form, Drupal provides the permissions. So this means that we can build even complicated authenticated user functionality into the front end pretty easily, just like I mentioned in the last slide, right? Preview draft content, web forums, whatever you're used to being able to control in Drupal's permission system, you can now control in the front end no matter what they're building it with. So this is, this is the stack, and it looks a little tricky, so we're going to walk through it one piece at a time. At the very back, we have our identity providers. Right? Auth0 gives us total free control over this. So these are the systems that hold various kinds of account data at a minimum, uh, some kind of username and password system. So Auth0 has its own list of users. It is actually the canonical data store for user information. So that's on there. Um, the client is interested in connecting their administrative AD to, to decide who are the, uh, the back-end editors. No problem. And they have a legacy Typo3 database that has a bunch of user content in it as well that's relevant to the forum. So they have a custom plugin. It's, I think it's eight lines that lets them, lets them do their user authentication based on whatever Typo3 is doing. Uh, Auth0 provides basic authentication through username and password. They're talking about including some social logins, Google, Facebook in particular. Um, but basically, I, I don't have to care as the back-end developer. Um, authentication is handled with a JavaScript embedded login box. 
it's exactly the same on front ends, it's the same on, on, for content admins on Drupal. We'll have a quick look at how easy that one was to implement. And once a user authenticates against Authio, they get a JSON web token uh, in their browser. How many people here have worked with JWTs before? Okay, only a few people less than have worked with LDAP bind. Good to know. Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, oh, yeah, well, that's the Authio authentication part. Drupal is our data provider, obviously, so on, uh, so on the first request, it validates the JWT. Authenticated users have accounts automatically generated for them in Drupal, so we do normal Drupal access checks with no fancy sauce required. And when we create the user accounts, they have invalid password sets, so the only way you can authenticate is through Auth0. The presentation layer is React Relay here. Uh, well, GraphQL Relay React, I guess if I'm going to be specific about it. It could be anything at all. All it needs to be able to do is make the HTTP request, show the Auth0 login form, uh, and pass the JWTs along with GraphQL queries. So I'm going to quickly... Oh, I see the problem now. So I'm going to quickly show off how straightforward the, the back end is for, uh, for the administrators that I don't really need to worry about their problems anymore. Oh, it didn't save my metadata. Well, that's fine. So this is the administrative interface for Auth0. I guess I should zoom this in a bit so I can read it and so you can. Oops. Adding different kinds of connections, different kinds of IDPs, identity providers, is nice and easy through a graphical UI. Turning on various social plugins. Super easy. Nothing magic. Do you have some enterprise authentication, uh, identification provider? Great. It even provides a handful of passwordless options. Authenticating people through touch ID is a pretty cool one that I want to get to use. It has a nice and simple user management interface. And this is where you start to see how extensible this is and what kind of information you get. Remember, we're talking about building 100 or so websites. We want single sign-on across all of them. And ideally, I'd like to know that it's the same person who authenticated with GitHub on site A and Google on site B and username and password on site C. So you can see that because it stores my primary identity provider, it'll actually also store what are the other identity providers I use. That's right, I'm not using refresh tokens. And we have audits, oh, except it's been a long time since I've logged in. More interesting is that you have a completely flexible me uh, metadata that you can attach onto here. So this is just simple JSON format. We're using this uh, as a place to store user roles and user roles as related to the specific front end domains. All of this information is available to me in the back end or in the front end if you choose to request it as a result from your as a result of the login operation. They are quite full service. We can go through a, the long list of functionality here, but what I wanted to show you is that this is a fantastic, easy to use interface that I didn't even have to train the client on. They were already very comfortable using it. So now we're going to switch back to presentation mode, ideally. Ideally. You guys mind seeing my browser along the top there? Because I don't know that I know how to get rid of it. Here. Yeah, but now I'm missing my other thing. All right, so this is how we, this is how easy it was for us to include the Authio login form in Drupal. This is just a twig template. Uh, that we massage into the login form, and you can see this is a really simple JavaScript 
we pass it the client ID, domain, and special callback URL from settings.php. Done. The login callback, uh, I mentioned that we passed it in from settings.php, so this is what actually gets executed. Uh, so we give a way to this for the user to disable it because that's just nice, or for the administrator anyway to disable it. And we use the Auth0 SDK. They offer SDKs for every language that I could think of, and the PHP one is extremely easy to use. So as long as we can manage Auth0 get user, we know that it was a valid login attempt. It also returns, uh, it also returns specific information on the same request, depending on what we had put, uh, what we had put into our auth params here on the JavaScript. So we can use that information. Obviously, what we care about here is email because of the way they're they're setting it up. Um, we don't have a unique username. We also provide uh, we also provide an event to respond on this, and this is actually where we do our more custom synchronization. Right? We looked at that metadata JSON, easy enough to pass it into Drupal roles. We map the Auth0 user accounts to Drupal user accounts with the external Auth module. Does anybody here remember user external, user external login register from D7? <laughs> I'm happy that you remember, Dries. Right. I think a lot of us in the consulting field were doing a lot of unnecessary work because we didn't realize that this was in 7. Now it's called out in a, in a module, and somehow it's a little bit easier to find. So it provides the convenience functions for mapping an external authentication system to Drupal user accounts. It's set up as a service, so it's very easy to include in whatever you're doing on the Drupal, on the Drupal 8 side. And it's too bad I didn't include the code line for this. Uh, and it means it also provides methods like login and register all in one all in one line, or separately login finalize if you just want to set the session. Very very easy to use, very very handy. Right, so this was extremely easy doing the Drupal part of this. Uh, I think we expected a lot more work involved. I mentioned briefly that when Auth0 authenticates you, it sets a JSON web token. So JSON web tokens are hot stuff, and you read about it a bunch on Hacker News, and people debate about what you're supposed to be doing with it and what you're not. And here's a brief idea about what it is. It's just three uh, um, 64 encoded strings. The first one is a header that says, uh, this, is how, this is how it is signed. This is how we validate the authenticity of this uh, particular token. The second part is the payload. That's actually, I know for those of you who don't read base64, uh, it's a bit hard to tell. But that's actually just absolutely any JSON that you want to pass in. And the third one is the signature. So that's how we actually get to validate that this is issued by who we think it's issued by. Actually, I'll stay on this for a bit. It's a pity I don't have my speaker notes, because that makes it a lot easier. Well, well, whatever. It's all right. So because you can do arbitrary JSON, there's a lot of people that like JWTs as a way to have actually zero knowledge front ends. Why not just include the whole user profile in there? You can put their user profile picture in there, their favorite MP3. You can store absolutely anything that you like. Part of the point about JWT is that it ends up in a relatively short string. This is a small amount of data. This should be able to be put into an HTTP header. You don't have to put it there. You can transfer it through whatever you want, and you can store it as a cookie. You can store it in local storage, again, whatever you want. But the point is that it's simple and it's light. Also. It's signed, um, which helps. It gives you the sense that this is something that, that you can really count on for privileged data. And that's true. But because this is a little more complicated than what we're used to with session cookies, because it's newer, 
there are a lot of gaps in how people implement. So one big gap that came up recently was when you have that first section, that header, you get to declare how, how, did it, how was this signed? Is this with RSA? Is this just an, SH, uh, an SHA signature? Or is it none? None is valid. And it turns out that most of the libraries for JWT accepted none as a valid value and didn't throw any kind of a notice that actually this could be issued by anyone at all. This kind of mistake seems to come up more and more with JWTs. The point is you don't want to pass around a ton of information with it. You actually really want to set a low expiry time on them. Uh, this is one of the things that's very common to put into the payload. And in fact, it's in a reserved namespace in the, in the payload. You can set an expiry. Note that that is an expiry that you, you don't have any way of controlling from the back end. You set it once, and then it's done. So you can't revoke a token. That's also a little problematic. If we have the entire user object in the token, what happens when I want to change the role and remove admin rights? I'm just going to wait for it to expire. Right? So it's really designed to be used with short expiry times uh, as a way of passing claims from one place to another. Right? Claims. Not the entire object. Claims. In fact, in their documentation, they use claims for all the top-level keys in the JSON array. It's, it seems like they're doing it just to confuse you. They're not. They're doing it to remind you exactly how this is supposed to be used. So that means that it doesn't replace a session cookie. If you are using it to replace a session cookie, you are doing it wrong. Uh, you use it to set the session. You use it to accept the information from Auth0 that, yes, this person is valid, and within this three-second time window, they have, admin, uh, they have the admin role. And we use that to set the, to this, to set the uh, session, just like normal. So this is, this is the code that we're using. Again, we're using the Auth0, uh, the Auth0 SDK to decode the token. It's pretty simple, but they have the convenience function, so we might as well use it. All we're grabbing out of it is mail, and we use that to set mail and name. And then you can see right at the very bottom, external auth service, we're using log login register. And that actually runs uh, that actually also runs login finalize, which sets the, second, the session, just like normal. So we really expected that authentication was going to be a difficult problem for us, right? A hundred websites in the front end shared between the front and the back, and God knows what custom IDPs and in what order and what custom rules we needed for them. Actually, what it turned out is that we selected, uh, we selected a provider, and it's a somebody else's problem field. I think we have a total of 30 lines of code plus 400 lines of tests for this. Much, much easier than we expected, uh, and very easy for a client to use. Back to you. I wasn't sure if I was going to get my part. Um, <laughs> so our front end stack, uh, which was actually supposed to be the biggest part of the presentation. Uh, yeah, I've got 20 minutes left. It's fine. So we are building on React. And uh, the, the stack itself is a little bit more complex than that. But let's talk about React first. Uh, React is um, a JavaScript library for rendering. It's a view library. Um, it is uh, or the key factors that make it so famous and so nice to use is they are, it's reactive, so you don't have to worry about state transitions. It is declarative. It has a very nice API. Uh, it is component-based, right? We're talking about component componentizing our seam layer right now. So React, with React, if you use the right approaches, we already have that for free. And it's super fast in the browser because it's based on a virtual DOM. Um, what's most important for our project, however, is that it pairs extremely well with GraphQL and Relay. So this is what a React component, a modern React component with uh, ES6, 7 looks like. Um, so you have this module file, and you define a component, and the component is, is defined in JSX, uh, which is very similar to HTML, and uh, is compiled by the bundler. Uh, we are using Webpack and Babel. Um, to simple method calls on, the, on React to create HTML elements, which are written into the virtual DOM and then passed on to the browser. So you don't have to worry about the browser API. You're just doing JSX, and React handles the rest for you. Um, what you see here, what's very interesting, so as I said, we are trying to make standalone components 
things that are very much uh, self-contained. So we are importing the styles. We are importing the CSS into the JavaScript. That is uh, weird, right? Um, um, I'm sure, who has seen that before here? Right, so this is uh, possible with Webpack. Um, it allows the styles CSS resolver or the, the uh, it resolver in the Webpack configuration to pick up the CSS file and instead of loading the actual uh, CSS file content, it will take the class names out of the CSS file and create um, and create a map out of it, a hash map, where the keys to the map are the class names and the values are base64 encoded strings which are unique across the entire application. They are guaranteed to be unique. So you don't have to um, come up with weirdly shaped class names with a lot of hyphens to make sure that they are really unique. And this is how you get true componentization inside of your React components. Um, you write a single file and everything inside of that file should um, be enough to um, cater for the entire needs of that component. And not only do we do that for CSS, we also have Relay. Um, normally when we are writing Twig templates in Drupal and we are rendering HTML to those Twig templates, we have to do a lot of pre-processing, we have to load stuff up front and then pass it into the template, right? So it's bottom to top, uh, top to bottom. And uh, in React with Relay and the GraphQL backend, we turn that upside down. So instead of the pre-processing or the um, uh, um, rendering step, first loading the data and then passing it into the template, the template itself specifies what data requirements it has in order to render all of the fields. Um, and that looks like this. So as you can see here, we have this component which uh, is trying to render the article ID, the article teaser image, title, lead text, and the creation time. And um, the way that that information flows into the React component is by using the create container function from Relay and then specifying the data requirements for the component. This is a fragment of a GraphQL query. Every component that is uh, enhanced with a Relay container can specify data requirements. And those data requirements are picked up in the rendering process of your React application. So when you do routing with React and Relay, and, you, uh, uh, and the new rendering tree becomes act active because you click the link, it will first figure out which components are going to be rendered on that page. And then from each of those components, if they are relay containers, it will pick up the data re the, uh, requirements from those components, merge them into a single query. That single GraphQL query is sent to the backend and GraphQL responds in a single um, payload and uh, at which point the data is again um, picked apart and sent down the tree to each component that requested the data. So if you, uh, um, if you, uh, if you want to show, uh, show additional information in your component, you don't have to worry about changing your view in the backend. You don't have to configure anything. You don't need to adapt any data layer stuff. You just need to uh, add the required, uh, the desired field to the query and you have to render it in the component and then it's done. So this is a very nice stack and the separate components, GraphQL, Relay and React, all from Facebook by the way, um, they can be really nicely combined into a very powerful um, application data fetching layer. Um, and I'd like to switch to monitor three now please. So we can look at the prototype. I'm sadly not allowed to tell you the name of the company that we are building this for, um, but I hope that we can come back to DrupalCon in Baltimore and give a um, case study. The uh, project is supposed to be uh, released or scheduled for release end of this year, and at which point we can show the full sites. But first of all, let's look at how we resolve routing and how we do data fetching with Relay. Can we switch to monitor three? I wouldn't want to do that on a Mac, I'm sorry. 
See, we, we are going through all this hassle of switching the monitors just because I don't like my accents. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so uh, what do we have here? This is, um, as you can see, I had to replace the logo and uh, change some, some colors and change some of the text that we are showing. But if I refresh the page now, um, you will first see that the JavaScript files we are loading, they are chunked. And this is something that Webpack does for us. We are bundling our application, and based on our route configuration, which you can see right here, um, so we have an articles route, for instance, and it says, OK, for the article route, the component from React that we are supposed to render is the articles component. And uh, by defining the, uh, the routing in this way, Webpack can figure out which files are required at what, what route, and it will intelligently um, build a dependency tree of all of those files in your stack and uh, build separate chunks, separate JavaScript bundles. So the front end, the client browser, really only receives the code that it needs in order to render the page that you're currently looking at. So this is what we have here, right? So the main JavaScript file, this is the common ground for all of the routes that we have. Um, that's why it's also the biggest file with 287 kilobytes. And uh, that file contains React, for instance, the router, it contains Relay, and all of the common dependencies that we have across all of these files. And then we have a couple of chunks. Those are um, separate JavaScript files that have been generated by Webpack, um, which are only required for the front page. And then if we switch to a different page, let me clear this up, you will see that it first loads another chunk that is required for fetching um, the, uh, or for rendering the second route that we are at now. And what you also see is that instead of doing a full re-render, it doesn't hit the server for uh, retrieving the HTML from scratch. Instead, it does an, um, a GraphQL request which responds with the data that we have, uh, that we require for rendering this page. So the GraphQL query, as I said, is generated automatically from all of the components that we see on this page, on this page. And each of the components can specify its data requirements. Um, so the GraphQL query looks like this. It's a gigantic generated query, and it's obfuscated, so it's very hard to read. But it contains all of the fields from the different components that are displayed here. So this is a single item from, from the request, and it's all there. So what happens if we go to another route? Again, we get another chunk. And now it's on this new route. And you can see it's very performant, because we are not hitting the server. We are only asking for data from the server. We are not rendering on the server anymore. However, if you look at the source code, you will see that this is a very large payload, a very large uh, chunk of HTML and JSON. And that is the first page that we requested. So if we disable JavaScript now, it would still work because we are doing server-side rendering at the same time. So if we go to the front page again, you'll see it's rendering the front page. And that's because the first request always comes through the Node.js and Express.js server. This is a huge benefit also for performance, not only for Google. If you're on a slow machine, and or in a slow connection, the JavaScript files don't have to be rendered for you to interact with the website. You can see the site, the CSS will be there, maybe the CSS is, uh, faster, uh, is loaded faster, and you can already interact with the site. You can even click links even before the JavaScript is done because then it's just a normal H, uh, href and the server answers with the second, site, uh, the second route again. Right. Okay. So if we look at this component here, this is an article. You see these data requirements here? Article is passed in as a property. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong component. So this is a, an article in, in, on, on Meta article, and uh, we have um, data requirements that are specified down here. And if you look up here, this is where we render them. It's very simple, and you don't need to do anything on the back end. OK, so we have nine minutes left. Is 
the conclusion. So what we find exciting in this is not just that we get to use a bunch of really cool technologies that you read about all the time. Okay, though, to be fair, that is also pretty fun. What's interesting, at least for me, is uh, this is a very different way of looking at Drupal's role in your website. And most of us are used to Drupal playing a central role, if not the defining role in your website and having to be, uh, having to really fulfill all needs. And it's just not the case anymore. It's one of the greatest strengths that we get with Drupal 8, is that now you consider Drupal a piece of your architecture, and not even necessarily the defining piece. In fact, one of the most powerful things that we're, that we're doing with this is that the data layer now, or that the front end can be actually really agnostic to what's going on in the back end. It doesn't need to care that it's Drupal underneath the hood. And we get to choose Drupal because it's so good at the data manipulation and data consumption from the various backend sources. I think that's about it. There's uh, seven minutes left for questions if people have them. No questions? You're all already React Relay experts? Yep. Hi, my name is Błażek, and I wanted to ask about the status of the Drupal module. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, is it like uh, ready to connect to Relay, and are mutations supported? <clears throat> yeah, that's for you. So, um, most quickly talked about that in the beginning. We have uh, a new branch in the module, which is based on a new library that supports Relay. So, the fundamental, the crucial part of the module is actually the PHP library that does the parsing and uh, um, yeah, handling of the GraphQL request. And we are using a library now that does that and it's capable of supporting Relay. The schema that we are writing right now is Relay compliant, and that's what we are working on right now in this week. So we are making it Relay compliant as we speak, essentially. Um, Fre uh, Frederick, who's sitting right behind you, is also working on, us, uh, on that with us together. So if you want to join us for that, feel free to come by at Spring's launch and find me. Oh, you asked about mutations as well? So mutations um, is another thing. It's on the roadmap. But for this sprint and this week, we are going to focus on relay and config entities and generating the schema with the new library that we are using now. Um, but config, uh, mutations is definitely possible as well, also with the library. If you use the module right now in the 3x version, you can already use mutations, but you have to create them yourself. You have to create the schema for the mutations yourself. It's very simple, though. Um, yeah, so I had a question about uh, the dynamically generated J JSON schema. One of the interesting things about the project that you're presenting is that potentially you could kick off the front end and the back end at the same time if you've got a well-defined schema. So do you just have to set like good ground rules about uh, what you'll call your field names within Drupal to ensure that the schema is achieved? Or is there any way that you can uh, kind of bridge bridge that gap, do you know what I mean? So, so that you could actually define the schema ahead of time yeah. and then have Drupal achieve that? Yes, so that's actually the way that we work. We um, not only decouple the front end from the back end, we also decouple both teams that were working on this project. So we have a front end team and we have a back end team. The back end team is currently largely working on migrations from the old systems and the front end team is working on the front end. Um, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Um, and the way that they work is we have a separate MongoDB-driven schema, which they create as they write their features in the front end. And it's very simple. They are using Mongoose, an NPM, li NPM library for interacting with the MongoDB storage. And they are using the GraphQL.js library to create a GraphQL schema out of that. It's very simple to cre create schemas with the JavaScript library. So, they are not blocked by the backend at all. And they will create the schema telling us essentially what features they need, what data model they need in the backend. So we are first building the front end, and then we are doing the backend afterwards. And that's a very good approach because then we are really catering for the requirements of our applications. For a company that, I'd like this very much, all this, all this new developments on the front end, and for, for a company that would uh, consider using React uh, or, or uh, GraphQL and the combination, um, how future-proof 
do you think this? Uh, how, what's the chance that, let's say, you build a site now and three years after you have to still maintain it? Uh, what's the chance that there will be people or even a future for, for this technology? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a very good question. Um, we have seen a wide adoption of React. Uh, uh, many, many great uh, big companies use it now. Same with GraphQL. GraphQL has been released in the 1.0 version now. Uh, the spec is like production ready now. It's considered production ready. Um, and it's used by, by GitHub. It's used by Facebook. It's used by Instagram, Netflix, React as well. Um, so I see that GraphQL actually, although it is less popular than React at this point, has a much more has a br much brighter future because I think that it's a very very nice approach to solving the HTTP API problem. Um, React is a, a, a solution to the pr a problem that we have right now with our DOM tree in the browser. Right, it's a solution to performance problem essentially, um, and uh, I see that at some point React will again fade from from existence, but it's, that doesn't mean it's not going to be maintained anymore. Too many big players are relying on it at this point. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Thank, yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, hi. About the uh, GraphQL uh, queries, um, is it the entity uh, reference also taken care of so I can go deep in getting the information? And also, uh, when you showed the, the access for a field, uh, how can we distinguish between uh, no access and undefined or no data in that field? Um, I'm not sure that you can distinguish right now that case. Um, we, we could add that distinction. I don't think that's hard to do. Um, but right now, the schema we generate doesn't do that. Um, uh, before that, you asked about entity references. Uh, I showed an example during the presentation uh, when I retrieve the UID field from an entity, um, at a type data, taped data layer, that's an entity reference. Um, and I, I traversed into that entity reference and showed you the time zone and language for that user. Um, but, uh, how so, deep can, so imagine you have in that user. It, you can go like 10 levels deep. Okay. It's, it's really, as far as you would need to go, you can keep traversing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of hiring developers for the front-end stuff, did you try and, like, do you hire specialist React developers, or do you kind of try and upskill, have you tried to upskill um, current Drupal themers and front-end devs? Yeah, so um, for this project, uh, the client originally wanted to go with Angular, and then we uh, told them that's not going to happen. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, so <laughs> what we did was we, took an existing starter kit for React, uh, built a prototype, and convinced the client. And then we educated the client on React and Relay and GraphQL. Um, so they have a yeah, nicely sized team at five, six developers, maybe. And we did some workshops in the beginning, and they were very smart. And so they quickly picked it up. And so the client is mostly providing the front end team. Right. Um, but we educated them on the React stack. Yeah. Any more questions? All right, so that's perfect. We're at 20 seconds. Right, Thanks for your time. Everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>